London news agents. Mr Speaker, with his backbenchers looking for a unity candidate to replace him, which of the now numerous born-again Thatcherites on the Labour front bench <laughs> does he believe best fits the bill? That is Stephen Flynn, uh, the leader of the SNP, trying to cause mischief on the Labour front bench. Not that he needs to, because it does seem there are an awful lot of Labour front benchers talking about Margaret Thatcher in slightly admiring tones. It is 34 years since she stopped being Prime Minister. Lewis Goodall barely born at that stage in the universe, but yet she's still casting this long shadow. And another person who was a babe in arms when Thatcher was in power was Rachel Reeves, who now seems to be almost trying to inhabit that former conservative dominatrix. She's not the only one on the front bench. David Lammy is doing it too for Labour. So today we're asking why her shadow is so great and what they're actually trying to tell us. Welcome to the News Agents. It's John. It's Emily. It's Lewis. And, and it's l- the first time we've had dominatrix discussed on the News Agents, which I think is the first. I, to be I don't think it's the first, but I certainly think it's the earliest. <laughs> I don't even find that too much. No? No, you wouldn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> But it is interesting, isn't it, that, you know, it is so long ago since Margaret Thatcher stopped being a force in British politics, and yet she's still a force in British politics. And I kind of can't quite work it out in some ways, because if you look at the end of the Thatcher period, when her cabinet were in turmoil over her position on Europe, the poll tax had been an absolute catastrophe and had brought riots to the streets, and nobody really thought it was a good idea. Yet everyone looks it back as this it was the halcyon days of British politics. So, so we should say that the, there has been a particular run of this of late. So obviously on the Conservative side, she is a heroine. She is the person against against whom you must always be judged against. Uh, during the 2022 Conservative leadership contest, of course, we had the absurdity of not only Rishi Sunak, you know, saying he's, you know, the most Thatcherite Thatcher right man in Britain, more Thatcher than Thatcher, but also Liz Truss quite literally cosplaying as Thatcher, sort of dressing up in the pussy bow blouse. <laughs> oh, First time tank. we had pussy bow blouse in as well, by the way, uh, on the debate stage. And then, but even on the Labour side recently, you've had Keir Starmer saying that he admired Thatcher because she changed Britain so much. David Lammy, the shadow foreign secretary, has said in the last 24 hours that Margaret Thatcher was a visionary. And Rachel Reeves, and this is the one that has got everyone talking, she delivered the Mays Lecture last night. The Mays Lecture is this, an economics business lecture that chancellors, shadow chancellors, big economic figures in Britain deliver. It happens every year and they have to set out their economic thinking. She actually didn't mention Thatcher by name in the speech, but the pre-briefing done to the papers was how the 1980s was this period of great change and it was spun, presumably by Rachel Reeves Spinners, as again admiration of Thatcher herself. So this is this sort of odd, as Emily was saying, this longest of long shadows that continues to dominate British politics. I think what they admire, or or what Rachel Reeves and David Lammy would say they admire, is her strength in affecting the things she believes in. Not necessarily that they believe in the same things as her. And I think it's partly as a result of what I'm going to call weak politics, right? I mean, Rishi Sunak embodies, sorry Rishi, but embodies somebody who doesn't really appear to stand for anything very much. We've called him technocratic. I think that might be generous. He's almost like the office manager, but we don't know quite what he believes in, quite what his ideology is, quite what he wants to be strong about. He's pushing forward an asylum policy for Rwanda that we know he doesn't particularly believe in. And so I guess the point about Thatcher was that you could hate her or love her, but you couldn't deny that she did what she wanted to do. And to put that in context, I mean, just to really drill down to what she was doing, you know, 79 onwards, she basically decided that it didn't matter if unemployment rose. I mean, that was a massive jump from what had been before. You no longer care about the numbers of the unemployment because your goal is bigger than that. You don't care about cuts to public spending because your goal is bigger than that. You're basically admitting you are going to take pain. You are going to take pain on behalf of the nation to get your stuff done. 
And I guess the point about that is, you know, it was disastrous for many, many communities. And I, you know, I grew up in Sheffield during the miners' strike and I remember it intimately and, and, and viscerally. But she decided that the place where she wanted the country to be was more important than the collateral damage that happened along the way. I mean, that's certainly a take on the Thatcher years. And look, you know, unemployment, you know, I am the one in 10, um, you know, the three million unemployed um, that UB40 sang yeah. about was part of the Thatcher legacy. It was also about fundamental reform of the UK economy. It was about the share owning democracy, selling off the, pro you know, the nationalised industries, putting them into private hands, some of which was very successful. I mean, why was British Airways ever a state owned industry? Some of less so. The sale of council houses, people enjoyed having their own front door that hadn't been supplied by the council and that they could have a, feel they've got a step on the property ladder. And there were other things as well. But I think what she, the main thing was the flexible labour markets that she introduced, which meant that it attracted big inward investment to the UK when actually a lot of UK industry was dying and couldn't compete in the world. And the fact that there was sort of cheaper labour that wasn't as heavily unionised, unions had to change the ways they uh, kind of legislated mm. in terms of strike action and there were no longer wildcat strikes and all the rest of it and secondary picketing. That was a big change. Yeah, to but to UK. go back to where we started, that's not what Rachel Reeves wants to be remembered for. That's not what David Lammy's endorsing, right? Yeah, well, let's listen. I mean, David, we've got the clip of David Lammy talking about Thatcher, so let's listen to that. It's from a new podcast from Politico with Anne McAlvoy. Shadow Chancellor has given a, a speech actually just on the day I'm talking to you, a couple of days ahead of release of this uh, podcast, channeling the Margaret Thatcher legacy and basically suggesting this is an inflection point for Labour economically. When this was suggested, was your thought, man, is that a bit weird? Well, no, actually, I think it's very apposite. If you look back to the end of the 1970s, Britain on its knees, sick man of Europe, we weren't even able to bury our dead and um, sort out our rubbish. I'm afraid we were in a mess and it did need um, big economics to get us out of that mess. Now, you can take issue with um, Mrs. Thatcher's prescription, but she had a big manifesto for change uh, and set about a course uh, that lasted um, uh, for over two decades. If you're looking for a reason as to why Thatcher keeps being cited by Starmer, by Reeves, by Lammy, he's just encapsulated it really well. What they're trying to do, and Reeves does this in the Mays lecture repeatedly, it is not so much that they are particularly admiring her policy or even her politics. What they're trying to do is basically equate the political moment that we're in now, in 2024, with the moment that Thatcher faced in 1978-79. They're trying to draw that parallel that the Conservatives did for years. They constantly always invoked the chaos of the 1970s. The Labour Party will return, as it was then, under Wilson and Callaghan, to this sort of politics of decline from which Margaret Thatcher rescued us. Now, that is a myth in all sorts of ways. But that is the kind of myth that the Labour front bench are now trying to draw upon to bring to their advantage instead, to turn against the Conservatives, that we are in a moment, they say, of profound decay, a profound decline, of economic mismanagement, and of a Britain which no longer matters in the world. And what they are saying, and it's a different prescription, but their diagnosis is the same, and they are saying, and Reeves said in the May's lecture last night, that Britain needs a different political and economic paradigm as she needed then, in the late 1970s in order to rescue us from that decline. There is one other thing that's just worth adding to exactly what you said, which I agree with. It's weakness and strength. Labour want to portray the present Conservative government as weak. And if you're ever invoking Margaret Thatcher, it's the Iron Lady. It's tough. It's the swinging but that handbag. Itself is a myth. <laughs> you, of course. Yeah. But it, it is that I am tough. I am take the tough decisions for Britain's future. And that is what Labour wants to ally itself to as much as any political idea, which is probably pretty abstract in terms of the solutions at the end of the 1970s when Thatcher came to power in 79 are not what Labour is facing in 2024. There are very different problems. Yeah, I'd also say, I mean, something often overlooked um, during those early years of Thatcher is that when she was enacting her policies, she was also simultaneously receiving massive oil revenues from the North Sea oil. Uh, I mean, this is sort of courtesy of Steve Richards, who writes about it in Turning Points. But no one realises quite how much she was helped economically yeah. 
by circumstances outside her own force. You know, she might be doing the cuts to public services. She might be doing sort of high unemployment. She is buoyed up by the economic atmosphere in which she is currently kind of reigning. And I think as soon as that disappears, then she gets into trouble, which is exactly what happens later. Well, that that is what is... if you. In terms of uh, Reeves' lecture uh, last night, that is what's really interesting, is that if you look beyond the headlines, which have all been dominated by this, so, you know, she's equating herself to such as she actually doesn't, but, you know, the pre-briefing is all about that. What the speech actually is, which is actually really interesting, really thoughtful, it is actually a repudiation of Thatcherism, and even to an extent New Labour, and a New Labour economic legacy. What she basically says is that the Thatcher boom was largely illusory in all sorts of ways, and that the idea that Nigel Lawson, Thatcher's Chancellor, articulated the kind of priest of Thatcherism in lots of ways, that the job of the state was just to get out of the way and to allow growth in terms of the macro economy to just allow, to, as Emily was saying, to just concentrate on inflation, be damned pretty much with everything else, and let the market deal with it. And then the new Labour thesis, which was not quite that, but it was to say that we should always be intensely relaxed about globalisation, that it cannot be fought and it should not be fought, and we shouldn't worry about things like national supply chains or offshoring and all of these sorts of things. She is saying that that era is gone, and in an era of profound global insecurity, it is more important than ever that there is an activist state. I think it's just worth listening to a little clip from that. We can see the shortcomings in Lawson's analysis on the other side of the equation too. Because in a world that has been repeatedly shaken by supply-side shocks, it is inadequate to see the fight against inflation as a matter for macroeconomic policy alone. Our resilience in the face of shocks brings questions of microeconomic policy around energy security, our domestic productive capacity and the strength of our supply chains to the fore in the fight against inflation. For a decade, the last Labour government offered stable politics alongside a stable economic environment. In New Labour's analysis, growth required, on the one hand, macroeconomic stability, and on the other, supply-side policies to enhance human capital and spur innovation. What followed was a decade of sustained economic growth, stability and rising household incomes. Average household disposable income rose by 40%. Two million children and three million pensioners were lifted from poverty. Public services were revitalised. But the analysis on which it was built was too narrow. Stability was a necessary but not a sufficient condition to generate private sector investment. An under-regulated financial sector could generate immense wealth but it posed profound structural risks too. And globalisation and new technologies could widen as well as diminish inequality. I think the other inadvertent message that Labour is sending out by this, funny enough, is that they are kind of quietly recognising there's going to be an electoral landslide. I think that's what they're sort of telling us. I mean, even though they will never say that out loud, because what they're essentially admitting is that whatever comes next needs to be huge. And you can only do that if you have a pretty solid majority behind you. And I think, you know, all this talk about, oh, we're not going to spend the 28 billion, we're not really going to do what Biden did with, you know, the the sort of Inflation Reduction Act. We're probably not going to challenge climate change as much as we can. We haven't got the money. If you look at Labour's biggest ever commitment to the state, came after the Second World War. We were absolutely broke, right? There was no money. There was no money. And yet under Attlee, you know, uh, the beverage report was enacted for housing, for the NHS, for this extraordinary vision of what a Labour government could do. And I sort of think that actually Rachel Reeves must be setting the scene in some way for something that is going to be as radical as that but against a backdrop of no money. Yeah, but I mean, how do you do a Keynesian stimulus package if you're going to say, we are going to stick stick to government spending totals and we are not going to borrow in that way? I just don't believe that there is a big kind of rebuilding of Britain, uh, you know, homes for heroes and a national health service going to emerge. I think they're going to borrow. 
You think they will? I do. This is the kind of paradox or the contradiction of the heart of it all at the moment, right? Is that unlike Blair in 97, um, what Starmer and Reeves are basically saying, as, as we've been saying, as she said in the speech last night, is that we are at a moment of profound, where profound political and economic transformation is needed. But obviously we are also at a moment, unlike, say, 97 or even 1979, where as a result of extremely high debt and interest rates being high and monetary policy being tight, the government doesn't have much money to play with. So what she's saying, and I think you, know, you can ask questions about all of these things, but she's saying that the growth, which is just desperately needed, will come from stability, which she says has not been available for some time. I mean, that is true. She's saying that uh, it will come about as a result of, yes, not a Biden big stimulus, but she says, and her team says, that is to misunderstand a bit what the Inflation Reduction Act and Bidenomics were about. It's as much as anything about incentives, tax incentives, and private industrial strategy, private partnerships. And that if you can get those things in place over time, you can have a reindustrialization and you can achieve that moment of economic, profound economic change. Now, I think you can question how much stability gets you. I think you can question just how far reaching those incentives and so on can be. And I think also, and this is the contradiction bit, as you allude to, John, what she also uh, accepted last night is she basically signed up to the fiscal rules, more or less, with some some modifications, but more or less signed up to Jeremy Hunt's fiscal rules. For how long? So can you do that well, for the duration of the parliament? parliament? And she's even saying that she's going to put into law that those fiscal rules cannot be changed unless the OBR says there's a national emergency and she must be allowed to do so. So... It's a tightrope she's walking. But as I say, it's an interesting speech. It's an interesting idea. And it's interesting how she's using Thatcher to try and channel it. But it's, it is difficult. But we spoke a little bit earlier about Thatcher uh, mythology and, you know, how people have sort of invented what they think Margaret Thatcher was and what she did and the policies that she followed. And they're not at all true because, I mean, you know, for example, uh, there weren't tax cuts immediately. Uh, that came a lot later on. So people just kind of like Liz Truss trying to say, I am Thatcher. No, you, no, you weren't Thatcher. But yesterday on GB News, we had someone on telling a Thatcher anecdote. <laughs> cabinet in the Ritz and the, the, they were taking the order for the main course and they all ordered beef or lamb or fish and the waiter said to Margaret and the vegetables she said um, they'll have the same as me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that story's true but it's a lovely story. Well I like Certainly. it. <laughs> it isn't. It is a spitting <laughs> image skit. The most famous the one. The <laughs> most famous one that has ever been played. It's the most famous satirical sketch on television. Here it is. Do you like to order, sir? Yes, I will have a steak. How do you like it? Oh, raw, please. And what about the vegetables? Oh, they'll have the same as me. <laughs> It's, it's just fabulous it's that a GB News contributor sort of passes that off as Thatcher at a dinner at the Ritz. I, I love it. We, we actually had got... context, we had location, <laughs> yeah, we exactly. had cutlery. Can I tell you my favourite... General fav steak. Yeah. My favourite um, Thatcher anecdote, which is courtesy of Nick Robinson, funny enough, at BBC News, um, was on the day that she died. And there was, as you can imagine, a in, very... In the Ritz. In the Ritz, exactly. And as you can imagine, the BBC is trying desperately hard to do an absolutely even-handed obit, which was, you know, this was the great things, this was the damage. And Nick Robinson has done the first package, you know, the, the report that they play after the headline's been announced. And it started, love her or loathe her, Margaret Thatcher was a visionary. And somebody didn't fade up the first bit. <laughs> so the package just went... Loathe her. Margaret Thatcher was a visionary. <laughs> and oh I was presenting at Complains. the time. And it was quite hard to sort of come back from that one and go, sorry, I know everything you think about the BBC, but actually we just we just didn't have the sound engineer who faded up the original words. But that GB news thing is, is amazing. It speaks to exactly where we started, right? Which is that the, the mythos of Thatcher has become so profound, particularly with inside the Conservative Party and, and, and you know, centre-right thinking within Britain, that even the stuff that is actual, you know, parody, yeah. sort of emphasising her strength and this idea, this lionisation of her, has actually, at least on that level, actually suffused to such an I extent as to become real on some level. Thatcher's contribution to the arts has been immense. Without Thatcher, yeah. you would not have had Billy Elliot, you would not have had The Full Monty, Ironically. you would not have had Brassed Off, you wouldn't have had UB The 40. Specials, UB40, Ghost Town. I mean, as is always the way, the sort of legacy that she left to communities was turned into something of extraordinary grace and quality because so so many people 
felt so strongly. But for the Conservative Party, again, it actually speaks. We talked about her role with the Labour, with the Labour Party or where she sits in Labour Party thinking. She is a tremendous... Her, her memory now is a tremendous problem for the Conservative Party because no matter what... And I thought they'd achieved it in 2019 with Boris Johnson and the Red Wall and this different sort of conservatism. And yet he goes and they instantly snap back to a kind of ersatz Thatcherism, a sort of mode of political economy and political thinking which actually has long gone and which they can't escape from. And, and it, it, it basically what it means is, is that they constantly think that in order to be a true conservative, you have to measure yourself against her. You have to be how she was and have her mode of thinking. And that reached its climax awesome. in Liz Truss. And this constant like seeking out of enemies, which she had, they think of her time as being heroic and she was constantly seeking out enemies. And that's what we have to do. And you can see the kind of ideological legacy of that in how a lot of conservatives think today. And it's, it's a big problem. I've literally heard Jacob Rees-Mogg call her mummy. Back to Dominatrix then. <laughs> then we're back exactly where we started. Uh, we're going to be back after the break with the former Foreign Secretary David Miliband. So the Rwanda bill has had its jolly outing uh, in the House of Lords um, and there was some opposition from Conservatives actually who were making the running on this but Labour kind of not because they suddenly support the Rwanda bill but because they don't want to be the non-elected chamber thwarting the will of the House of Commons and so the bill will now come back to the Commons where Rishi Sunak is hopeful that it will finally get onto the statute book and one day soon a plane will gleep into the skies. Gleep. Gleep. Will it gleep? Yes. It will gleep into the skies with uh, asylum seekers on board. Yeah, and in this upside down world in which we now live, Downing Street is actually accusing the House of Lords of lacking compassion um, because of the way that their peers tried to make amendments to the Rwanda bill. And Downing Street is now saying, oh, don't you care about the people? Smugglers, don't you care about, uh, you know, trying to save people's lives? It's all a bit topsy turvy, but it's interesting to see. We've said this before, but the passionate argument is coming from, you know, a handful, maybe a dozen conservative peers who really feel that stopping Rishi Sunak's Rwanda plan from going ahead is about more than just Rwanda. It's about holding on to things that conservatism used to mean abiding by the rule of law, abiding by treaties, abiding by international treaties, not trying to sort of change things to make white look black and black look white just because it suited your political purposes. And I think that's the most interesting battle that's going on now. Rishi Sunak, who is essentially trying to implement something that will probably never really get off the ground in the way that he wants. Keir Starmer today in the comments pointing out that this is going to have cost hundreds of millions of pounds to send a maximum of 300 people to and, Rwanda. And there has been a National Audit Office uh, report talking about the way the Home Office has splashed the cash on this. Mm -hmm. And instead of the Bibby Stock home and the use of old army camps saving millions of pounds for taxpayers and not keeping them in hotels, it's actually cost an extra £46 million because of the totally crap contracts that they have negotiated. They've said, we're going to take over the Pontins holiday camp, sign a contract and then not use it. And money has been spent on this. And it's the kind of recklessness that, you know, we've, you can just imagine ministers are saying, we just got to sign this now. We've said we're going to get this onto the statute book. Just move, 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 move. And they have moved at lightning speed and signed absolutely sh deals in a way almost that sort of resembles what happened at the time of COVID and you're trying to get gowns and all the rest of it. And so the government has ended up spending far more than it needed to. Well, we're going to talk now to the former Foreign Secretary, David Miliband, right now head of the IRC, the International Rescue Committee, very closely involved with the wider asylum immigration problem. David Miliband, I want to start with the government's Rwanda scheme because that's hurtling its way back towards the Commons from the Lords. It looks like it's going to be on the statute book. It looks as though a flight or two might take off to Rwanda with asylum seekers on it. Is there anything wrong with that? Everyone wants to have a solution to the management of migration. And if you ask yourself, is the Rwanda program a solution to the challenge of managing migration? The answer is no. Uh, it's obviously very expensive, tens of thousands of pounds per person, um, and no one's gone yet. Our experience, and we're an international aid agency, but we're also a refugee resettlement agency, in, in an, uh, an agency that supports asylum seekers in the US. 
Our experience is that what actually matters is first, the speed of asylum processing, because delayed processing is not either in the interests of asylum seekers or of uh, the, the country that they're trying to get to. Secondly, and critically, you have to have legal routes for people to register their interest in, in claiming asylum. In the United States, the Biden administration has extended that to five countries in Latin America, and they've seen the number of undocumented arrivals plummet, even in the midst of the overall numbers uh, going up. Thirdly, you have to have proper coordination across national, or in the American case, across state borders. And in Europe, that uh, hasn't been the case. The European Union has just adopted an asylum and immigration pact, or asylum and migration pact, obviously UK out of the EU, but we're not going to have a solution without engaging with the European Union. So from our point of view, there are much better ways of trying to manage migration than the Rwanda scheme. Don't you think that the issue of illegal migration is a real problem in the UK? Um, for Labour to say, oh, look, we're just going to deal with the upstream problem of the, the gangs that are doing this. It's just a bit sort of kind of complacent. Well, I would say to all parties the following. The choice that countries like Britain, America, the rest of Europe face is not between whether or not people try and come here or not. The choice is, do they have their application to come here managed in a regulated, planned, organised, safe and, I would argue, humane way? Or do they have their claims managed in a chaotic, harmful, inhumane way? What we know from all the experience around the world is that Cruelty is not actually a policy. Cruelty empowers the people smugglers. So addressing the people smuggling has to be part of the plan, but so does running an efficient asylum system, saying that those who qualify should integrate and those who don't qualify shouldn't stay. Those are absolutely vital alongside the safe and legal routes to disempower the people smugglers because they're the last people that you want to be empowered in this. Right. But, I mean, wouldn't the government say, well, that's exactly what we're doing? We're doing that and we're doing other things as well. Um, part of the Rwanda idea is, you know, to kind of to disincentivize people from trying to come across in a small boat because you might end up on a plane to Rwanda. But look, John, people know that they're risking their lives to come here and that's not deterring them. So let's be absolutely clear that a deterrence as your only policy, if that's the final redoubt for this, if you say, OK, leave aside the legalities, leave aside everything else, but all we're relying on is sending a message. Look, the message is there that people are desperate. There are 54 civil wars going on around the world. We've got, in, in many ways, a, a, a collapse or a crisis of diplomacy in many parts of the world. You've got a lot of people seeking to move for political reasons and a lot of people seeking to move for economic reasons. The asylum system is there for people who, for whom it's not safe to be at home. That has to be properly organised and properly run. Let's talk about that collapse, that crisis of diplomacy, because it is really apparent and really shocking uh, when you look now at everyone agreeing that Gaza is intolerable, everyone agreeing that it has to stop, that we have to get hostages out and stop um, further incursion and lives lost. And yet nothing is done. You've heard Chuck Schumer, you know, take to the floor in the US and say Netanyahu's got to be removed and, you know, everyone's up in arms for 24 hours and then nothing is done. You've got the same position with Zelensky screaming about the state that Ukraine's going to be left in by the West and nothing is done. What? Where is this I mean, am I just being naive or have we reached kind of peak apathy in terms of getting stuff done? I don't think we're, we're in a position of apathy. I don't think that's right. And I certainly don't think you're being naive. Just, just let's take them a, one at a time. I mean, on the Gaza front, I do want to go into this famine threat and how it's being, it's being calculated not as a piece of political rhetoric, but as a technical, serious piece of work. And I, just, I want to get into that. But just in terms of the wider politics, it's not the case in the US. I mean, as you know, I, I live in New York at the moment. Um, I think the last 50, 60 percent of the American public are, are still saying, no, this is a choice between whether you back Israel or whether you back Hamas and we back Israel. And maybe some of the um, positioning of the Biden administration reflects the fact that it's not quite as I can't remember the word you used one way or all on one side. 
just on this Gaza situation, because I do think it's important that people understand this. When the UN say there's an imminent threat of famine, that is not someone in New York putting out a press release. The international phase classification system is something that's used around the world. And it's very rare to declare a famine. In fact, NGOs like ours are often saying this IPC system, this international phase classification system, is too conservative. But they're saying something literally unprecedented, which is that within the space of five months, half of the population now are at what's called catastrophic levels of food insecurity, yeah. level five. Yeah. And the rest of them, the, the sort of lucky ones, so to speak, who are not in catastrophic situation, they're in level four, which is an emergency, or level three, which is crisis, which means you don't know where your next meal is coming from. So the, the stakes on this could not be higher. And while there are lots of fourth and fifth best options being discussed, airdrops, piers or, or into the sea, there are some first, second and third best options to do with the number of crossings, the regulation of trucks going in, the bureaucratic impediments to trucks going in that desperately need international muscle behind them. Well, are you saying that Israel is using hunger as a weapon of war? I'm saying that there are decisions being made by a range of author Israeli authorities at uh, national and, and local level, a range of decisions down to a World Food Programme convoy um, being blocked on uh, last week, on, on Tuesday night last week, that was carrying uh, food aid to northern, was it the World Food Programme, carrying uh, food aid to northern Gaza. And so a series of decisions, bureaucratic and or political, about the number of crossings, the bureaucracy associated with the vetting of what's going in. There's a whole issue to do with, uh, I heard today, a pair of scissors that's needed in for medical use is called dual use because it could be used for quote unquote military purposes and therefore the whole shipment gets blocked. Mm. If the fighting doesn't get you, the danger is that the threat of famine or, or, or also a public health emergency gets you. David Miliband, great to speak to you. Thanks very much, Emily. Thank you very much, John. So there was surprise news in Dublin today. Leo Varadkar, the Irish Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, had been Taoiseach before, leader of the Fianna Gael party, basically the sort of centre-right party, Conservative party, has announced that he's resigning and he's no longer going to be Taoiseach after April the 16th. This is what he said on the steps of Leinster House. When I became party leader and Taoiseach back in June 2017, I knew that one part of leadership is knowing when the time has come to pass on the baton to somebody else and then having the courage to do it. That time is now. On a personal level, I've enjoyed being Taoiseach, leader and cabinet member since March 2011. I've learned so much about so many things, met so many people who I'd never got to meet, been to places I would never have seen but with home and abroad. And I am deeply grateful for it. And despite the challenges, I would wholeheartedly recommend a career in politics to anyone who's considering it. It is such an emotional yeah. moment that the breaking voice, he talked about his personal and political reasons, and he also said, I'm not the best person for the job anymore. And I'm sure when the dust has settled, we will learn more about exactly what those personal reasons are, those, you know, personal political reasons are. But he sounded like a man who was making a speech he wasn't quite ready to give. Well, you just kind of... It's obviously been a painful process. You, As you say, Emily, we have no idea what the personal reasons are. But, yeah, it didn't sound like he was kind of cheerfully thinking, right, job done, thank you all, I'm not going to run at the next election. It sounded just a little more raw. I mean, the rawness was what yeah. came through. One of the reasons it's it's been unexpected is, you know... Ireland will have its own general election, latest possible date is sort of early next year. They're currently in an arrangement, Fianna Gael and Fianna, Gael and Fianna Foil, where they've been rotating the, the Taoiseach. So Michal Martin, leader of Fianna Foil, was Taoiseach, and then after two years, stepped down for Varadkar, who became 
Taoiseach again. He's only 45. I mean, I mean they're in a, a coalition, basically. They're, they're in a coalition yeah. to keep Sinn Féin out. And, you know, the Sinn Féin are doing very well in the polls. And there is a prospect, a possibility, that Sinn Féin could become, enter government or become, you know, Mary Lou Macdonald, the leader, could, could become Taoiseach. And you could have a Sinn Féin first in minister North. in Northern Ireland, a Sinn Féin I mean, that, that Taoiseach quite, in the Republic, which is ahead, extraordinary. But it is quite a moment that if they are the, oh, largest, no. per, if they are the largest party, as well, they are already, yeah. in Northern Ireland, and if they win before February 25, then you have two lots of Sinn Féin in one ununited Ireland. Yeah, and, and, you know, look, because you have to go back sort of 25 years, mm. we used to say Sinn Féin, the political wing of the Irish Republican Army. Yeah. And they could be in government in the North and the South, which would be extraordinary. And they moved on a lot from that, of course, and there were lots of sort of complicated history before it. But there is, and this is, I think, why Varadkar's resignation matters in terms of stopping from that from happening, if you want to stop that from happening, is that it relies basically on Fine Gael and Fianna Foyle, their share of the vote, staying to at least where it was before, on the good relationship between Michal Martin and Leo Varadkar, which has been quite good. Yeah. There is now going to be a replacement leader of Fine Gael, then that has its own dynamic. So it just introduces that element of instability into the arrangements that no one saw coming. And doubtless, of course, Mary Lou Macdonald will say, as a result of this, bring that election forward because this coalition will have even less, less legitimacy, in her view, and the but view also, of her supporters. I mean, before we turn our back on, on Leo Radka, he has been an extraordinary statesman. Yes, his achievements... His uh, achievements have been immense. I mean, he's brought in incredibly progressive policies to the Republic of Ireland, whether it's about gay marriage, whether it's about, you know, the abortion rights, women's reproductive rights. He has been a very solid friend to the UK right through um, Brexit and beyond. I mean, it was him and Boris Johnson that actually, didn't they sort of memorably, went for a walk to the get Wirral things Summit. done. The Wirral Summit. They went for a walk to try and On patch the out the absolute mess that we'd been left in after the referendum with no particular deal and, you know, Boris Johnson threatening the hardest of hard Brexits and has worked with Rishi Sunak over the Windsor framework subsequently. Yeah. I mean, I think it's and really... And also worked with the European Union to keep the European Union completely. 100% supportive of the Irish position about how this needs to be resolved. Which and was and also bring important. us... Yes, exactly. Bring us close together. He's, 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 he's got a pretty... Um, I think he's got, he's got a pretty mixed reputation in, in Ireland, though. I mean, in the sense that, particularly with... There, there is a, a feeling, and there is a something that Sinn Féin has been capitaliz capitalising on, but potentially others as well, that he has let taking his eye off the ball, particularly with the rise of a particularly virulent type of populist, really with quite unpleasant politics that's been growing in Ireland, far-right politics which has been growing in Ireland. And he, it's no fault of his own particularly, but he has become a sort of symbol used in that kind of, in that politics. This guy is elite, is sort of a distant everything. And of course, this all comes off the bat, we should say, of the fact that there was a referendum, what, a couple of weeks ago yeah. in Ireland, which was about changing... The 1937 37 provision of the Constitution, which basically stipulated kind of like what a woman's role was in terms of the family and all it of this stuff. basically tried to remove sexist language, didn't it? Very yeah. arcane sort of, you know, motherhood and apple pie language from the Constitution. Yes, exactly. And <coughs> uh, he has been blamed by a lot of people for basically botching that, rushing it, so it coincided with International Women's Day. And it was a you know huge defeat. A lot of voters were confused about it, about what it meant. Communication was bad. And it went down to a massive defeat. And that has been quite a destabilising moment in some ways in that kind of progressive history of Ireland. So I don't think you can divorce that political failure from what's just happened. But yeah, it's taken people by surprise. We'll be back tomorrow. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye-bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 